Before I do this, do I want some notation? No. I'll just go straight to an example. If a of t equals negative um, 32, find uh, s of t. Now, I'm not putting a lot of detail here because I just drew a picture on the board for you. I'm giving you an acceleration function, right? And I'm asking you for what? The position function, right? Well, let's go for it. First, let's go one step backwards. So we have s of t goes to v of t goes to a of t. And going from left to right, that's differentiation. And antiderivative is going the other way. So if we're at a of t, we have to do the antiderivative one time to get here. So what would v of t be? Negative 32. T, negative 32t, only because we're using the variable t instead of x, right? Okay, negative 32t, what? Plus some constant. And we don't know what that constant is, do we? And then if we want to go back again to get a of t, then can you take the antiderivative of negative 32t? So it'll be negative 32. What's the power on this one? It's t to the first power, so we're using power rule, times 1 over 1 plus 1 t to the 1 plus 1. I think you could do that in your head, but that's 1 half t squared. But what about the antiderivative of c? ct, right? Some constant times t. Don't worry about it. it happens. So let's see here. Hold on. What's, uh, this is 1 half, isn't it? And half of that is? Negative 16 t squared. Oh, wait, I didn't add the constant. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, yeah I need to add a constant here. I forgot to do it. Plus, now, I can't use c because I already use c. So let's use d. All right? So we have plus ct plus d. So have I found... <sighs> this is s of t. Sorry about that. s of t, s of t. Change it. Sorry, we went to v of t, we did the antiderivative to get to s of t. I put a of t, please change that. So we started at a of t, we came back, got the velocity, and then went back again and got the position function. So have we answered the question? Yes, but there's a whole lot I don't know about this function, right? There's a whole lot I don't know. Like, I don't know what c and d are. But I can tell you this, that if your acceleration is this constant, negative 32, mm -hmm. that your position is a quadratic function. Right? That's, that's what that says. Think about that again. <coughs> if your acceleration is constant, your position is quadratic. You following that? Can you give me an example of an acceleration that you are familiar with, maybe, that is constant? Physics? Gravity. gravity. What's gravitational acceleration on Earth? <coughs> Negative 9.8 meters per second per second, right? If you convert that to feet per second, per second, it comes out to about negative 32, which is why I use negative 32. If this is the acceleration of gravity on Earth, if an object is falling on Earth under the influence of just gravitational force, its position can be modeled with a quadratic function. And maybe you saw this in college algebra, maybe not. Anybody see this um, function? It's for falling objects on Earth. Okay, this right here. Yep, kinematics, this is it, right? Where does this formula come from? It comes from the idea that under the influence of a constant acceleration, you must have your position be quadratic for any planet that has constant, uh, constant gravity, right? 
So look at, you see this C here? That's that. And D is that. Now, my physics people, do you, can you tell me what this number is? Like what it's supposed to represent? <coughs> like where it comes from? D naught. It's, it's your initial position. And this is your initial velocity. But we're getting too far away. I, I just wanted you to see like, we just showed something amazing if you really look at a big picture. We have shown with calculus that under the influence of a constant acceleration, your position must be quadratic. All right, now, I'm going to do this same problem. But I'm going to add a little bit more information. Remember, I said that when you go backwards, you lose information? So I need to give you a little bit more information for you to be able to nail down that C and that D. So here's what I'm going to tell you. If A of T is negative 32, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the velocity. V of 1 is 8. And I'm going to tell you also that S of 0 is 4. So now I'm giving you all of this. All of that information now. Now can you give me S of T? And will it be a family or is it going to be the exact position function? We'll see. I think it's going to be exact. Let's see. So let's go back. Um, first we do um, find the antiderivative. We got V of T was negative 32T <coughs> plus C, right? That's, that's what we knew. But what does this now tell us? <coughs> when we plug in 1 for T, the velocity needs to be 8, right? That's what that's saying? So right here, how, ma how many variables do we have? We have like t, right? And then c we don't know. And then this side, this is what comes out of the function, right? So according to this information in blue, what I can do is I can take this and I can say 8 equals negative 32 times 1 plus c. Y'all understand where I got all that? The only thing I don't know is c, right? And I can solve for it. So what will that be? 40. C is 40. So now that I know that C is 40, I can come back to this velocity function that I didn't quite know I had a family before, but now I actually know what the C is. So my velocity function is exactly negative 32t plus 40. You see how just with that one piece of information, just that one piece of information, I have nailed down the function. Exactly. If you want to look at it kind of like more abstractly, do you remember when I drew all those parabolas and I said, you know, it's a whole family of them? This piece of information right here tells us that that point, 1, 8, has to be on the curve. So if you go to 1, 8, like 1, 8, pff, there's only one function that goes through that point, 1, 8. So we've, we've nailed it down. OK? All right, y'all have a good one. I'll see y'all next time. I'm kidding. I had to. All right. We're not there yet, right? We, we get to go backwards one more time. So now my position function, s of t, is the antiderivative of this. Uh, negative 16t squared. We did that earlier. Plus, now the antiderivative 40, 40t, and then plus some constant, right? I'm not going to use c. Even though I could, I'm not because I don't want to confuse it with that one. So I'll call that d. And actually, I usually use capital D. I don't know why I'm using lowercase d today. Use what you want, OK? Did I just drop something? Oh, thank you. OK, same thing. We have some information, right? When you plug in 0 to the position function, you should get 4. So using that information, I know that when I replace this right here, it should become 4 must equal whatever I get when I plug 0 in here for t, which just kills everything off, right? Just d is left. So d is 4.
Yep. Right? Zero here, zero here. Gone. D is four. So we now have the exact precise po uh, position function. It is negative 16 t squared plus 40t plus 4. There we go. No, shouldn't be. Why? I thought there has to be a No, that's only if I peek out too loud. Hey! There you go. Yeah. Thank you, though. Thanks for, for looking out. I can see on my um, camera, I can see my audio bar moving. That's usually what I look at to make sure it's moving. All right. Yes? We're good? We're going to do the same problem, but I'm going to give you something else. I'll never forget when I learned this for the first time, I was quite amazed by it. I don't know why, it was, it really, it struck me as being pretty remarkable. Um, I can remember vividly driving down I-10 near 410 with my dad in the car, he was driving, and I, and I remember asking him, you know, if I give you, you know, like if you knew the acceleration of something at every point in time, like, do you think you could go back all the way and figure out where it was at every point in time? He's like, no way, son, that's crazy, you know? <laughs> and he's right, it's crazy unless you have some information, right? But you don't need a lot. What did we need in order to do it? Two Just two points, that's it. Two points. So think about it, again, more abstractly. All I tell you is that you have acceleration, right? Here's the function. And then I tell you that its velocity at one point in time is this, and its position at one point in time is this. That's it. And from that, you can tell me exactly where it is at every point in time. I just I think that's crazy. All right. Um, this time, I'm going to tell you that s of 1 is 8, and s of 4 is 30. <clears throat> What's different about this problem? I give you two points still, right? But I don't give you anything about velocity. I just give you two position points. So can we still do it? Well, what do we know about V of t? We've, this is the third time we've done it. It's negative 32t plus some constant, right? Now, I can't nail down that constant. I don't know what it is. But I can do my antiderivative again and go to A of t. And I have negative 16t squared plus ct plus d. That's where we were when I gave you the problem the first time, right? Say again? Oh, I, I did. See, I did exactly the same way I did it earlier, too. <laughs> so we had that earlier, right? And there's a little bit of a problem here because s of 1 being 8 means that when I plug in 1 for t, I should get 8 to come out, right? But the problem is I have two things I don't know, right? So like if I use this, that tells me that 8 must be equal to, let's see, I'm plugging in 1 here, negative 16 plus 1 here, c plus d. And that equation has two variables in it, so I can't solve this. This becomes 24 equals c plus d, yeah? And I can't solve for c or d and get a nice number. But that's only using one of the points. The other one is going to give me a similar result, isn't it? When I plug in 4 for this, I get, what, 30 equals? And I'm plugging in 4 here. Yes, we have to do this. 4 squared is 16 times 16, 256, but negative, right? So negative 256, and then, see, I'm plugging in 4 here, so plus uh, 4c, right? Because I'm plugging in 4 for t, and then plus d. 
And go ahead and add 256 to both sides. And what do we have? 286 equals 4C plus D, like that. Still can't do it because there's two variables. Now you have, though, this is the thing, though. You have two equations and two unknowns. So you set up a system of equations, right? Just like you did in college algebra. So I have basically a system of equations. This is the notation we usually use. And I'm going to put it this way. C plus D is 24. And then the other one is 4C plus D equals 286. And then we go solve that system of equations. Right? Now, if there, there are, I would say, three methods for solving systems of equations. One of them is called substitution. The other one is called elimination. And the other one is called computers, right? <laughs> So um, we may as well talk about this now. How many of you have a, a graphing calculator? Anybody not have a graphing calculator for this class? Okay. For those of you who do have them, does anybody not have a Texas Instruments graphing calculator? So Hewlett Packard or something different? What do you have? I don't know. You don't know? What okay. Is it's not TI? Okay. So look, there's going to come a point later on in this class <coughs> where we're going to have to solve systems of equations and they're going to be like, like in college algebra, you did like three equations, three unknowns, and those got pretty nasty. We're going to be doing like five equations, five unknowns, six, six unknowns. And potentially it could get nasty. So I'm going to try and help you learn how to use your calculators to solve systems of equations. Now, on a test in class, I will not ask you to solve a six equations, you know, thing. Um, but I will allow you to use your calculator, all right? Not telling people who don't have one to go buy one. I'm just saying that, you know, if you're in the STEM field, it might be time to get a graphing calculator and, you know, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to solve this real quick um, because it's been a while since we've solved these. So I am going to choose to do this by elimination. I'm going to multiply the, sorry, I'm going to multiply the top row by negative one. And the reason I do that is because the d's are off by, I can make them cancel each other out. So imagine just making that negative, that negative, and that negative, right? That's, that's allowed. And now add the two equations straight down. And when you do that, you should get 3c, the d's cancel, and what do we have here? 262. And now you can solve for c. So C is going to be, and I don't think I made this problem nice, so what is that? 8. 87.333 or something like that? Okay, 87.3 repeated, whatever. And then once you know what C is, right, you go back and get D. So just plug in, like, you can go back in here, go back to the original one. Like, if I know that that's... Uh, 87.3, then I can just subtract it and I get D. So using 24 equals 87.3 plus D, I get that D is, I don't know, I can't do arithmetic, 60, negative 62.7, is that right? Something like that? What is it? Oh, yeah. This is 3.3. Who cares? Right? It's just arithmetic. Yeah. My arithmetic has is, is always been terrible. I, I had actually, I talked to one of my former Cal 2 students who's in, uh, like, a, he's a math major and he's doing, like, higher stuff now. And I always told my, my classes, like, you know, like, just because someone's, like, up here teaching math doesn't mean like I'm like a calculator, like a human calculator. Like I hate arithmetic. And, and uh, he was telling me like, I get it now. Like I just, it's like you reserve part of your brain for certain things, you know? And like arithmetic to me just isn't, uh, isn't important anymore. Now for you, you need to do the arithmetic correctly, but 
You know, it's like, who cares at this point? All right, understand? You can go all the way from your acceleration function all the way back to the position function. You can nail it down exactly. You just need two pieces of information. That's all you need. All right? Questions? You just broke your calculator. Okay, okay, okay. I still have a little bit of time here. Um, Oh, the sign-in. Thank you. Okay, so I asked you to think about when you might want to come visit me. So what I've done is I've provided, there's one page here that says Mondays and Wednesdays, and it's front and back. That's Monday, Wednesday. It gives you the different days on the front and different days on the back and time slots. I'm only going out to the end of October on this, all right? I think that I would like to meet with everyone. I think I had said by the end of the semester, but I think by the end of October, you know, within the next two months, we should meet if you want the bonus. And then uh, Tuesday, Thursday is the second page. And then anyone who can't make these will have to make special appointments with me. All right? Does anyone already have something set up? Wh what time? Can you, can you put the, oh, 11.50? Can you do 11.45? Okay, so tomorrow's uh, Wednesday. Just fill yours out. Just do, wait a minute, whoa, hold on, what did I do? Okay, you know what, don't worry about it, because this is starting for next week. Okay, right here? All right, just make sure you fill it out. If you don't fill it out today, I'll bring that to class every time, and you can make a decision later, but you're going to lose options, you know, people are going to start taking them. Okay, um... Just trying to decide if I really want to get into this. I think we, I think we can. I know. What? Ten minutes. So it's all right. We need, we need to at least introduce ourselves to the idea. And again, I think some of you have seen this. Maybe. Well. Our, our goal for the next, I'm also going to pass the sign and sheet around. Um, our goal for the next, well, until, until October 2nd, all right? Our goal until October 2nd is to try and figure out how to find the antiderivatives of things, all right? And this, this right here, substitution, is the first of six techniques that we will be using. Techniques, not formulas. Remember I said techniques? There will be six techniques. Use substitution, integration by parts, uh, trig, trig integrals, uh, trigonometric substitution, partial fraction decomposition, and I'm missing one. Who cares? This is the first one, okay? This is the first one. This is by far the easiest, but you have to, like, you have to have this. From here on, it's a pyramid, okay? If, you, if we miss a layer, you can't go up, all right? So when we, when we talk about this, you know, deep next time, that next class, you got to, you know, go home. You got to get that homework done. You got to understand it, all right? All right, so here we go. Let's do this. I would like us to try and find the antiderivative of this. Now, we only have nine minutes. Let's start ruling some things out. This is not a common function. Right? It's not like, oh, it's just cosine, so the antiderivative is sine. It's not just x to a power, so we can't do that. It's not a bunch of x's split up, you know, where you can maybe, like, massage it properly and get it to, you know, look good. You know what I'm saying? It's a product, and products are bad. Right? Products are bad. But there's one thing in here 
I just want to see if anyone just says, like, recognize, like, hey, look, but this is, you know, kind of. Okay, the 2x is the derivative of x squared. Do you all see that? The 2x is the derivative of x squared. So let me rephrase this. Do you see something and its derivative? Yes? Say it again. Do you see something and its derivative? What is the something that you see? The x squared. And what is its derivative? 2x. Yes? So maybe, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could make a substitution. If I let u be equal to x squared, then the derivative of u with respect to x would be 2x, right? And then maybe I could just come back over here and rewrite my function, but instead of a function of x, call it a function of u. And this sine part, make it sine of u instead of x squared. And then what would the 2x be? It would be the derivative of this, right? So somehow this would be like, I don't know, I'll put it out front, du dx. Now look, we're going to have a completely different notation for this next class. I just, I want you to think about this. <clears throat> if it were this, would that be easier for you to find the antiderivative of? Like, would, if it was just sine u, what would the antiderivative be? If it was just sine u, what would the antiderivative be? Negative cosine, negative cosine u, right? Yes. Negative cosine u. And this right here, I want you just to ignore it until we get into this more formally next class. But it's, a, it's kind of a, a guess here. Maybe the, maybe, the function is, maybe the function is just cosine u. A negative, y'all said, right? And then what was x? I mean, what was u? It was x squared. Maybe it's just negative cosine x squared. Maybe it is, plus c. How, how about we just take the derivative of this? What's a derivative? So this is a chain rule, right? You take derivative of uh, cosine of something, you get negative sine, but we already have a negative, so that would give you just positive sine of x squared. But then you take derivative of what's inside, and that would give you the 2x, right? So this is it, right? But it required me making some sort of substitution and realizing I could replace this with u. And then I understood that this right here is just the derivative part that would fall out with the chain rule. And that's what substitution is all about, is you must see something and its derivative. And then whatever you see, you go and you try and see if you can work it out. So we'll do that more next class, all right? I mean, I, I want to, we have to get some notation out of the way first. Um, any questions on anything? Now that we're, we're into the second week, any questions about the syllabus or attendance? Did this get around? No? Okay. Make sure you sign in. <coughs> Yeah, I was thinking about getting a little bit of